When the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were established at the end of World War II, a third international organization, focused on international trade, was supposed to be created as well. Instead, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, was established as an interim. It was not until 1995, when the GATT transitioned into the World Trade Organization, that the international organization focused on liberalizing international trade envisioned at Bretton Woods actually materialized. Before we turn to the WTO, it's important to get a few definitions out of the way. Tariffs are taxes placed on goods imported into a country. These are sometimes used to increase government revenues, but more often they are used to protect domestic industries from foreign competition because they raise the price of imported goods. Quotas are numerical or quantitative restrictions on the amount of goods imported into a country. Most textiles are subject to quotas, meaning that the United States government sets a finite number of very specific clothing items, for example, men's white, no logo, pocketed t-shirts with crew necks that can be imported from a specific country. Once the quota is reached, no further imports of items meeting that description from a country are accepted in a year. Subsidies are direct payments from government to producers. In agriculture, for example, the United States and the European Union both provide extensive price supports and subsidies to their farmers. The World Trade Organization was established in 1995 and today has 159 members, which collectively account for more than 97% of the world's total trade. Broadly speaking, the World Trade Organization's mission is to liberalize international trade and reduce trade barriers. In the short run, it focuses on converting subsidies and quotas to tariffs, and then, by negoti and then negotiating reductions in the level of those tariffs. WTO member states commit themselves to remove trade barriers and resolve trade disputes based on three broad principles. First, the principle of economic liberalism, which we've discussed previously. Additionally, the WTO requires member states to abide by the principles of most favored nation and national treatment. Most favored nation means that all members of the WTO must offer their lowest tariff rates and highest import quotas to all other members of the WTO. If the United States imposes a 2% tariff on German automobiles, for example, it could not impose a 20% tariff on Japanese automobiles entering the United States because both are members of the WTO. Importantly, trade blocks like NAFTA and the European Union are exempted from the MFN requirement. The principle of national treatment prohibits member states from threatening producers from treating producers differently than it treats its own citizens. Imported and locally produced goods, in other words, must be treated equally, at least after the foreign goods have entered the market. This prevents governments from requiring the purchase of domestically produced goods. Collectively, MFN and national treatment are the carrot that compels so many countries to seek WTO membership. The World Trade Organization actually encompasses a broad number of trade agreements and a dispute settlement mechanism intended to resolve trade disputes and prevent the outbreak of trade wars. At, ex at its inception, the WTO included the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, the Trade Related Investment Measures Agreement, and the agreement on agriculture. These are all explored in your text, so I won't address them here. The WTO also includes a dispute settlement mechanism. The dispute settlement mechanism provides a forum through which states can bring and receive the settlement of disputes without resorting to the kind of destructive trade wars and downward spirals that sparked the Great Depression. Settlements, disputes brought to the WTO are initiated at the request of member states. Once a dispute is filed, consultation begins. At that point, parties have a 60, 60 days to attempt to reach a resolution. If they're unable to do so, a panel hearing is convened. The panel consists of three trade experts selected by the WTO Secretariat for their expertise. They generally take between six and nine months to hear evidence and reach a decision. Once their decision is rendered, it may either be implemented or one of the parties may issue an appeal. If an appeal is issued, a separate panel appeal, uh, appeals panel is struck by the Secretariat. That panel reviews the decision of the lower panel and can hear additional evidence. 
The decision is then forwarded to the Dispute Settlement Board. Once the DSB accepts the appellate panel's decision, the decision is final. If a country's trade policy is found to violate WTO rules, it is required to amend its trade policy and come into compliance as outlined by the DSB. If the country does not, the aggrieved country is permitted to impose countervailing tariffs against the violating country's exports up to the amount of the penalty imposed by the WTO. In total, the WTO has heard more than 350 disputes since this dispute settlement mechanism was established in 1995. Perhaps not surprisingly, the vast majority of disputes to date have involved either the United States or the Soviet Union, excuse me, or the European Union, or frequently both, as one complaint, one, as one is the complainant as the other is the respondent. Most disputes have centered on one of four key areas, dumping, the selling of goods below the cost of production, the protection of the environment, food safety standards, or labor standards. And while all WTO members have equal standing, standing to bring a dispute in theory, in practice, the enforcement mechanism serves to undermine the utility of the panel for many developing countries. Because enforcement relies ultimately on the ability of a country to impose countervailing tariffs on countries which violate WTO rules, countries with larger economies are better positioned to enforce decisions. The United States, for example, cares very little about whether or not a country like Costa Rica imposes higher tariffs on American exports, but Costa Rica cares a great deal about access to American markets. As a result, it is much less likely to file suit against the United States because even if it wins, Costa Rica cannot afford to enforce the penalty. Perhaps the most famous criticisms of the WTO emerged in the Seattle protests in 1999, when the WTO was slated to launch a new round of trade negotiations to further liberalize international trade. However, massive protests took place in the streets of Seattle, drawing attention to what activists contended were policies that undermined local communities, the environment, and the power of trade unions. Importantly, the, to the, equally importantly to the collapse of the Seattle talks, though, was the developing unity among countries from the third world that emerged in the context of WTO talks for the first time. At issue was the question of what the primary focus of the WTO should be. Since the early days of the GATT agreement, international trade had largely been liberalized along lines favorable to the developing world. Trade in goods for which the developed world had comparative advantage, namely manufactured goods, had largely been liberalized and was now subject to low tariffs. Goods for which developing countries had comparative advantage by contrasts continued to be subject to high tariffs and subsidies. The WTO operates on the basis of consensus, effectively affording any country a veto. In practice, though, WTO agreements had historically been negotiated by the United States and the European Union and then presented to developing countries for their signatures. The position of developing countries in international negotiations was further undermined by their inability to field full delegations. While the United States trade delegation at the WTO might consist of dozens of lawyers, economists, and professional negotiators and diplomats, a country like Seychelles might be represented by a single person, the ambassador in which the meeting was, to the country in which the meeting was taking place. As a result, developing countries could not participate in the multi-stage, multi-site negotiations as equal partners. But at Seattle, something interesting happened. The developing countries, particularly the Africa group, met ahead of time and developed a unified front. They would partner at negotiations and divide the responsibility between them. This permitted them to have representatives in every negotiation. At the same time, they collectively agreed that they would not sign any agreement that did not address their concerns. Seattle thus marked an important break from the historical pattern of international negotiations. As a result, no agreement was reached in Seattle, but shortly afterwards at a meeting in Doha, the WTO agreed to put forward a development agenda focused on the concerns of the third world. While it included reducing tariffs on industrial goods, it also included issues like liberalizing agricultural trade, reducing agricultural subsidies, and ensuring access to essential medicines that were a particular concern to the global south. However, the Doha development agenda, originally imposed, proposed in 2001, has been stalled largely over disputes between developed and developing countries in the area of agricultural subsidies. 
Despite regular meetings, no real progress has been made on the agenda since 2008. More broadly, a host of other critiques have been leveled against the WTO. Critics argue, as we noted above, that the dispute resolution process is unfair, placing economic concerns above protection of the environment, human health, and welfare. Further, they argue, the WTO provides uneven liberalization of trade, undermining development in the global south. Additionally, its closed structure and lack of transparency serve to erode national sovereignty and hurt the poor. But despite the failure to further liberalize trade since 1995 and all the criticisms leveled against it, the World Trade Organization remains one of the most important global institutions today, setting the rules by which countries manage their trade. As a result, it has a central importance in understanding contemporary global development.